This is a sheer on Likute Sicha Yishelek Yudchas, the 18th book of Likute Sicha, and it's the Sicha of Yud Beis and Yud Gimel Tamuz, and it goes as follows. It's well known that each month has its special content, and it's understood, and especially that everything is by divine providence, that this month, that a month that it has within it that contains a special day, or special days, so the content of that month is connected with the content of the days that feature in that month. For example, we know this very clearly from the month of Adar. The month of Adar, the day of Purim, the days of Purim, 14th to 15th of Adar, they create within the month an energy that the entire month is, the entire month is considered a month that is transformed from the opposite of the to joy. As it says in the Megillah, the entire month is exchange for them till there's actually a halacha that if somebody doesn't have megillah you can and he's only going to have him he only has access to megillah during the month of adar but not in the days of purim if no other choice exists one can read the megillah during the other days in other words because the month of adar is totally dominated by the days of purim even though there are only two days within the month also we know the law when the month of Adar comes in, we start increasing in joy. It doesn't say when Purim comes. Misha Nichnas Adar, from when the month of Adar comes in. Because that, again, those special days dominate the entire month. Same thing as with Pesach, that the entire month of Nisan is called Chaydish Agula, the month of redemption. Even though there's just a few days in the month of Pesach, the entire month gets colored by those events. When it comes to Tammuz, we find two, two conflicting things. First of all, the traditional... Not, the traditional... Uh, um, association of Tammuz is what it says in the written Torah in the book of Scharia that it's the Tzayim Arivi it's the there's a, there's a fast that's in the fourth month it's the fast of 17th of Tammuz that's the day when the city of Yer, the walls of Yerushalayim were breached now here there is a very intense and active dialogue in the Rebbe's footnotes because while we say that it is the 17th day of Tammuz that the walls of Yerushalayim were breached, that's what it says in the Rishalmi. But I want you to know that from the verses and from the Psukim, it seems that it took place on the 9th of Tammuz. And the Gemara and the Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud, seems to say that in the first, that the Psukim, the verses that speak about the wall being breached on the 9th of Tammuz, is a reference to the first Beis Amikdash. And the second Beis Amikdash, it was on the 17th of Tammuz. And uh, there is a lot of talk here about to reconcile why it is we fast on the 17th day of Tammuz, which was the day when it uh, was breached on the second Beis Hamikdash. In the end, it comes to a very fascinating um, reconciliation that says that possibly we can learn that the ninth of the month was actually when the outer wall was breached. And then, even in the first temple, and then it took a long time. It took from the ninth of the month till the seventeenth, eight days, till they got to the middle of the month. And we'll see later on. The Rebbe learns from this that it seems, if you, we learn this way, that there's a huge um, new piece of news here that Hashem waited. How far is it from the outer wall to the inner wall? Hashem waited and prolonged the defeat of the breach of the inner wall. But maybe the people do teshuva. But we'll, we'll mention that again later. I, I'm have not dealt with this exhaustively whatsoever. I just wanted to point out to you because it's such a beautiful um, scuba dive underwater into the Haggah life, into the footnote life. I just had to mention it. And anyway, so the 19th day, the, 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 definitely we're, the Pasuk speaks about the Tzayim Haravi. Pasuk in Zechariah speaks about the fasts. It speaks about Tzayim Haravi, which is the fast of the fourth month. Fourth month has been the month of Tammuz. So, 17th of Tammuz dominates the month as far as we're concerned. So, that means it's a month that's a month of, uh, of, 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 of uh, destruction. Right? So, it's not a happy month. However, especially we know that the three weeks called the Bein HaMetzorim between the straits, between Shavas and Tammuz, and Tishbof start in Tammuz. However, on the other hand, in our generation, we know Tammuz. Tammuz is a day of redemption. You'd base Tammuz, the day where Chagag Ola, the festival of redemption with Al Tereb, where the previous Rebbe, the Rebbe's Shver, the Rebbe's father in law, was totally released from the imprisonment and the exile. Remember that first on the third day of Tammuz, 
the Frit Rebbe was sent to Kostrama, was sent to exile. And then that was um, changed on the 12th and 13th of Tammuz to total freedom. So now we have an item not of destruction, but an item of redemption. And it wasn't just a personal redemption because the Frit Rebbe writes in his letter, heralding the redemption, he says, it's not just me that Hashem redeemed on Yud Beis Tammuz, everybody who's mechavevei teiroseinu hakedosha who hold the Torah dear. Or who are re mitzvah, those that keep mitzvahs. Or vekames asher b'shem Yisrael yichuna, anybody who even considers himself nicknamed as Yisrael, loosely associated with Yisrael, for them all, it's a day of redemption. They all also were endangered together with me because of what I represent, and it's therefore a day of celebration for all. All kinds of Jews, for them it's a festival of redemption. So of course in this we understand that that's also something fundamental and colors the entire month. So how can there be, how do you reconcile? On the one hand, it's a month where we talk about um, exile. On the other hand, it's a month where we talk about redemption. Now, in square brackets, says the Rebbe, now don't ask me, well, look, chronologically, obviously, what's what's critical, what, what, what colors the month is destruction, because this the destruction started two and a half thousand years ago, starting for the first base Amikdash. The Geula, the redemption of the previous Rebbe came in 1927. So you got 2,000 plus, a couple of hundred years where all the month of Tammuz was, was the opposite of redemption. So how can you now come and say that 100 and, uh, what is it now, from 1927 to 2022, you do the maths. Um, it's, going, it's going to be 100 years soon. How can you say that almost 100 years ago, all of a sudden that changed? So the Rebbe, that's not a question why in all the generations there was nothing redemptive about the month of Tammuz. Now all of a sudden we say that it's a month of redemption. When did that change? No, it doesn't have to change. Because we know, we find a lot of times that even though something exists, it doesn't always become revealed right away. We find many things in Torah. The whole Torah was given to to Moshe at Sinai. But then there's extrapolations. There are new things that come to light later on. What does that mean? there are things that need to become to light to a certain time period. For example, the month of Adar. At the time of Purim, we became aware that the month of Adar is a month of redemption. It always had that possibility, but it comes to light at a later time. Similarly, now when we come closer to the coming of Mashiach, the coming of Mashiach, and that was the generation of, that's called the heels of Mashiach, right before the last Redeemer is going to come, Melech HaMashiach, the King Mashiach, and this time, there needed to be the revelation of something that always existed in potential in the month of Tammuz, the concept of redemption. So now we have to understand how do these two things reconcile the redemption of Tammuz and the mourning of Tammuz, base. Same way, there's these two extremes, two separate kinds of days in the month of Tammuz. Similarly, in the very name of Tammuz, we find two radically different themes. Listen to this. First of all, the name of Tammuz is, from, is the name of, a, of, a, of an idol. As it says in the book of Yechezkel, speaks about Hanashim, Hanashim Yoshveis Mevakis Es Tamuz, women that were sitting and crying about the Tamuz. Who's the Tamuz? The Tamuz is a idol. What does that idol do? The idol, it's heated up from the inside, and it has eyes of lead. When you heat it up enough from the inside, it's the lead starts bleeding, and it looks like it's tearing. So they're crying with the Tammuz. In other words, somehow they're trying to do some kind of a, of, a, of a service where they're arousing mercy, maybe heavenly mercy, whatever they're trying to do idolatrous, with, in an idolatrous way. But it's coming through this trickery. So something gets heated up inside and then the eyes look like they're, they're, like they're watering, like they're, the eyes which are lit. So that's obviously the lowest level we could talk about, literally idolatry. On the other hand, Chassidus explains that actually the word Tammuz it's from the word of firing up. Interesting, the Rebbe quotes, where do we see Rashi in the book of Yechezkel, which speaks about the idol of Tammuz. says it's called Tammuz because it was heated up from the inside and then the eyes of lead bled. And then Rashi says, and the word Tammuz is related to heating up a fire. And that's a quote from Daniel, which interests just to give you uh, some fascinating thing. The king was very upset um, that the uh, people were bowing to his to his image and he said i want the 
furnace heated up seven times its usual heat. And the word used there is the word related, similar to Tamos, um, the word um, Mazia or whatever it is there. And indeed, it was heated up seven times its thing. And Hananiah, Mishal, and Azariah were thrown into that fiery furnace and they didn't get burnt. They walked around as if it was nothing happening. So there was that was Hashem's but anyway, the word used there is related to Tamil, same same source, same same uh, root word, and that there it means heat. So now one second, if the word Tamil really means heat, so Hasidus says, let's look at this concept of heat and say that that's why Tamil is called Tamil, but what is heat? It's not Tamil the way it relates to heat, relates relating to an idol, to an idol on the contrary. Heat, let's just think of heat as coming from the sun. Coming from the sun, what is the spiritual source of the heat of the sun? We know that it says in Tehillim, Hashem is like a like a sun, fiery sun. Which is why the sun is a parable for two things. First of all, for the fact that the way Hashem created the world, nothing changes. It's like the sun doesn't change. So that's a muscle, it's a parable for Hashem that does not changing. And also how the world is nothing before Hashem. How do we know that? We know that Mushal from Tanya saying, imagine the ray of light in the body of the sun. It's nothing. So we are from a ray of Hashem and we are in the body of the sun, body of Hashem. We are in the presence of Hashem. So we're nothing. So the sun is actually a very powerful tool to teach us about Hashem. And really, the fact that there is an intense sun in the more sunlight in the times of the summer, really internally it's coming, it's hinting and emanating from the sun of Hashem. And the fact that in the month of Thomas it's very hot, it's connected with the strength of the revelation of the name of Hashem, which is represented by sun. In other words, in this time period of Tammuz, the name of Hashem, which is higher than nature, is more shining than a whole year. And that's why we can understand why we call this month the month of Tammuz, even though it's the name of Avedah Zorah. We know there's, there's a prohibition. You're not allowed to use, call something by the name of idolatry. So really, there's an answer for that because the Gemara says that any Avedah Zorah, which the name is used in the Torah, you're allowed to use its name. Tammuz says in the Torah, so that means you're allowed to use the names. However, you're allowed to use the name, but it's not a must to use the name. So why did the Why did they say to use that word Tamos? Why didn't they get some other kind of name? It's very interesting. If you want to look at the inside of the sicha, this is just a. <laughs> he says in in the, in the Yiddish here, he says you're allowed to say a avedazara that is written in the Torah. Muter lahaskir, nit amuz. It's not a must. Do you hear that word? Nit tamuz, nit tamuz, tamuz. Here it's Yiddish. The word, anyway, if you're looking into the into the actual sicha, it'll it'll jump out of you. Nit amuz. It's not a must. So why do we call it tamuz? Why don't we pick another name? Why are we using the name of Avedah Zorah, which we're allowed to use? Why Dafka use it? According to this, we'll understand. There's no question. The fact that we call it tamuz is because of the heat, because of the heat that represents the name of Hashem, and that's when the, the light of Hashem shines more strongly. Ah, there are some people that when they say the word tamuz, they're referring back to the idolatry. So we know what Chazal tell us about something similar. Where, uh, where somebody asks, and the Gemara says, yeah, so if, if, if people can make a mistake about the sun and the moon and worship them, why does Hashem let them be? So uh, who answered? Uh, the Tano there, who answered? Answered, Ye ovid elohim ne Should Hashem destroy His world just because there are some stupid people that think that there's a sun and a moon, that they have some independence? <laughs> So just because some people think that Tamos is the name of an idolatry, does that mean that uh, we can't refer, we can't have in mind to refer to this as being a name that praises Hashem with a great benefit, with a great advantage and virtue of being the strength of the revelation of Hashem as represented by the sun? And also here we see a Chiddush. What it says in Teresh Sav, interesting, this is something that just developed much longer. What it says in the Pasuk in Cheskel about the women crying with the Tamos, referring to idolatry this was for thousands of years all the generations this is the way Tammuz was understood in the lowest possible way that it's talking about it's an, it's named after an idolatry remember the names of the names of the month came with the Jews from Bovel 
דווקא פנימי של התאלה, דווקא קיים חסידס, the inner track of תאלה, the way it was revealed in the latter years, more recent years, in the, in the, in the teachings of חסידסם, and it reveals and let, let, it, let it be made known to all that Tammuz actually refers to the strength of the warmth of the, of, of the sun that is uh, representing Hashem, so to speak. So it's, it's, a, it's a total turnaround in a way. Tammuz used to mean just, it's a reference to uh, idolatry, even though, because it says in the Torah, so it doesn't refer anymore to idolatry, we've kind of canceled it out. But really we're saying now the Hasidus reveals that Tammuz also means the heat and the power and the potency which is representative of the potency of Hashem. As it says in Tehillim, Kishem and Shemak, Hashem and Hashem is compared to a son. So let's understand how this, all these things work together. So again, we'd be able to explain this, that the fact that the same month has these two conflicting things. Golos, redemption, uh, exile and destruction and holiday of Geula. We could say that actually one influences the other. What's the purpose of it saying? The purpose of a fast is not that a person should be pained. It's not just to afflict us. You know, when, the intention is not to stay fasting. The intention is that the fast should become transformed to a day of joy. As the prophecy is, that when Mashiach comes, the fast will be transformed to days of joy. And we can understand this from looking at the reason for a fast and understand What's the reason for the fast? The reason for the fast is because we went into 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 Golos, into exile. Okay, when you look at Golos, why does Hashem give us exile? Not to stay in exile. The purpose of Hashem putting us into exile is to allow us to develop somehow to go through the process and get to redemption. So similarly, the whole purpose of the fast is in order that it should be transformed. in order to remind ourselves that the reason we're here at all in exile is because of our sin that's why our sages that's why Hashem put in, in, the, in, the, in the, by the word of the prophets the fasts one of the fasts being the month of Tammuz a time where we had tragedy and so therefore he injected also a day of redemption to tell us hey guys don't worry it was a day of destruction but there's also redemption waiting for you after you overcome the reason that brought you destruction after you overcome the sins just like in the month of Av after Tishba we have the month of Chamish Asaba we have the 15th of Av and then we have the Shabbos of Nachum Shabbos of Comfort which reminds us about the comfort that Hashem is going to heal us and comfort us after the morning of Tishba however that's not enough to explain it this way why? because two things that would be if the day of Geula would come after the day of exile and destruction. In other words, in, in like we just said in the month of Av, first you have the destruction, then you have the 15th of Av. So it shows you that we have to go through the trouble, and if we do the right thing with the day of, dis, of, of, of disaster and fast, and use the fast in the right way, then we're going to turn it into a month of... Then we're going to get the, the, the comfort which comes after Tisha B'Av. However, you'd basically give all times, the 12th and 13th of times, the days of redemption of the previous Rebbe, before Shabbat Shabbat and before the three weeks start in general. So, that's under, so that may, gives us an inkling here that the concept of the redemption in Tamils is not the redemption that comes as a result and as of the purpose of the exile being fulfilled. It seems that it's something that comes as an introduction to the Gullahs. We're told before we even go into a situation of exile that there's this day of redemption. How does that work? Base, second point here. When these two things, Golos and Geula, exile and redemption, come together in one time, in one month that they come together in, so we understand that the thing that has to be most emphasized is the redemption. That's the purpose of, if there's two things going on, exile and redemption, what's, the, what's leading to what? The exile's purpose and, and, and culmination will be redemption. Even if you say you do have to emphasize the exile as well, because by understanding the depravity and 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 and, and, the, and the downwardness, of the lowliness of the exile, um, Dafka by understanding we were beaten up twice, and then we'll truly understand that the comforting and the redemption is even higher. But that's still only secondary to the main point. The main point being redemption. 
Mainless, we have to understand, if we're going to say that in Tamils, the main purpose here is Geula's redemption. How is it that for so many generations this wasn't at all known? If you're saying that this is the main thing, it's not like saying it's another point. I'm getting closer to the Gula now, we're going to tell you, well, remember that if you do the right thing with the fast, you're going to go to the Gula. We're saying this is the whole point of this month, the whole point of the Golas is the Gula. So why did that not come out till very recently? That puts here also in square brackets that we could say that the reason that B'nai Yisro, we know that, B'nai, that the custom amongst Yidin is to call the month of Av, Menachem Av. It's brought already in Targum, it's brought in the mission of the word Menachem Av. Because right away when we talk about Av, we want to talk about the comforting of it. So I want to say the month of Av is not really about the pain and destruction, it's about the comforting that's going to come out of that. That's already since the generations, generations back, the time of the Mishnah already, we're talking about the comfort of Av. With, with Tammuz, if that's the main thing, is the redemption, why did we just start talking about it in 1927? It wasn't revealed to them. And by the way, in the Ha'orah, it says the concept of Av, even when you talk about the month of Av, Av means Father. Father is mercy. So the whole month of Av is infused, although it's very sad and there's and there's destruction of destruction by Samita, of course. But you see already that there's there there's there's the the focus on redemption and on comfort is already there within the very month at the very same time from the time of the Mishnah where we're focused on the negativity of Av. With Tammuz, we don't find such a thing. From this, all we can understand, Dalit says that Rebbe, that the content of the month of Tammuz is taka the same. It is true, the main thing of the month of Tammuz is actually the fast. However, there's two ways to understand the fast. One, the way the fast is externally, in its simple understanding, and that looks like it's something of destruction, with suffering, that's why I fast. Then, based, there's the inner aspect of the fast. The way the fast will be when Mashiach comes. Because then it will be, the niglek fate Hashem, the glory of Hashem will be revealed. And once you reveal, you take away the mask, take away the facade, then this day is going to be a day of sosin and simcha, jubilance and joy, moyad toiv, it's going to be a great yom, it's going to be a great holiday. In other words, we're going to have the recognition it's not just that it's suffering in order to come to redemption, but that the fast itself is in its inner sense, internally, in its deepest core, it's actually something of joy. How? Because really, even the, dis- even the suffering, the puranius, the destruction and suffering, in its core, it's an expression of Hashem's love to the Yidin. And that's why it's like the marshal of you know what marshal Alter brings in Tanya, like a king who's God of Veneri, he's awesome and great, and he with his own self, with his own majesty, washes the excrement, washes the dirtiness of the waste of his only son, because of his great love for his son. So you know sometimes just to wash off. The, the the number two, as they say, wash off the the uh, excrement of the sun. And sometimes you have to give a little a little uh, sometimes you have to rub a little. If you've had the experience of <laughs> changing a child's diaper, sometimes a child cries. It's it's a little uncomfortable for it. But that comes from love. You want to clean the child. And this says the Rebbe here in the square brackets. This is also hinted in the fact that. There is brought in the Torah, Gedele and Peske Yisrael, great leaders of the Jewish people from hundreds of years back, who said that there, there's a way of Aleph base where the first letter, the last letter, second letter, second to last letter, third letter, correlate. And we have Gematrias that work that way. At Bash, Gar Dak, that's what's called. And then they say, the Torah brings that we can know the days of Yomim Toivim, various holidays by using this process with Pesach. So Aleph, the first day of Pesach, At, Aleph, Tov, Aleph, first day of Pesach, is the same day of the week as Tisha B'Av. Base, second day of Pesach, same day as Shavuos, etc. It goes on with the uh, Tupurim and, and, and all the Yom Tevim. So what's the connection between first day Pesach, which is redemption, and Tisha B'Av, which is destruction? It always comes out the same day. But this is a hint that really, deep down, they're both expressions of Asam's chesed. And actually, listen to this counterintuitive here. In this din, in the judgment where Hashem, so to speak, judging His people and dealing with them harshly, 
there is an expression of innermost love which becomes revealed more by the strict attitude that Hashem has to his children just like a father that punishes his child because he did something they shouldn't have done so the strictness of a father is a result of the love of the strength of the love and that's why that although the father is by nature such a compassionate person but because he loves his son so much he has to act strictly in order to rectify his ways it comes from love in the country when he has to leave his nature being compassionate and be strict it requires more effort on his part it comes from a greater level of love that he loves the child it's easy to eh, to be moved to act the way you don't usually act to act with strictness is an expression of the deep love the strength of the love this that's why Chassidus explains that when Mashiach comes Tisha B'Av is going to be a Yom Tif. it's going to be a greater Yom Tif than all the other Yom Tif, all the other holidays which we could ask the question, Tak, Beis HaMikdash, the third Beis HaMikdash will be destroyed. So obviously we understand there's no reason to um, fast on Tisha B'Av. <laughs> the destruction has been re, reworked, re, 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 uh, we walked it back. We now have a building of the Beis HaMikdash. But it should just go back to being a, a, a regular day then. Why does it go back to being a holiday, a special day? If you if it was a, a sad day because the base was destroyed and now the base of Middash isn't destroyed, so it should just go back being a mediocre day, a regular day. Nishtahin, nishtahin. But the explanation is because the inner aspect of Tisha B'av, even now, is an expression of Hashem's deep core love to us. However, so long as we're still seeing the strictness and the anger, so to speak, of Hashem, because that's what expresses itself in a time of exile. Hashem is concealed. And the deep love is only if you think about it is in a concealed way ask a kid do you like your parent uh, disciplining you they'll say no let him just get a little bit older and understand that that discipline was so love filled right but when he's being disciplined doesn't like it we're in the stage now we're being disciplined the love is still hidden so on this so on tish so on, on tish above we don't feel the love we feel the disciplining of hashem so to speak but after Hashem takes away the anger, which is going to be when Mashiach comes, so what's going to be, what's going to be exposed is the pnimius, the innermost aspect. Ah. So automatically that day is going to be a very special day because the day really does express Hashem's great love to us. Just when we're in the process, when it's not revealed, the love is not revealed, but the, the disciplinary and as, uh, attitude is revealed, we can't, we can't, we can't celebrate that day. When that will be revealed, then we'll celebrate that day. Yeshlema, so we could say that this is also the reason why in all the generations, in a revealed way, the only thing we know about, the only thing we could relate to is the concept of the fast that took place in Tamils. Because as we said, the strength and the inner core of the love and the redemption of Tamils was hidden and concealed in strictness. Negative things happened. Hashem was, so to speak, treating us with gevura, with strictness only in the generation of the heels of Mashiach when we start already to taste and already there's a, a, a shine of the ultimate redemption then it's the time to start tasting also this concept about the inner energies of the day what's really going on beneath the surface of the fast and in general of the three weeks there's a great great thing going on and we're going to go back i'm going to go back uh, soon to out of 48 i think that's why the abish the made as an introduction and as a preparation to the three weeks he made the miracle of you basically gimel tamils you understand it's a preparatory thing it needs to give us insight into the three weeks it's not that after the three weeks we, we do teshuva because we remember the the destruction we do teshuva and then we're going to talk about redemption no we're going to talk now, as we're coming closer to Mashiach, this is a holiday that didn't come thousands of years ago. We're there, it would have had to come after. You couldn't yet, we didn't yet have access. It wasn't close enough to Mashiach where we could already get into the core of what's, what, what, of, 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 of what's happening now even. 
In other words, it's a great, great thing to be able to understand that even what's taking place now, what looks bad, is actually has an inner lining of good. That can only come now when we're closer to Mashiach. Especially that in the redemption of, of your basic of Tamos, there's two points. First of all, it shows the first has to be the concept of strictness. Because in order for there to be a superior light, it comes after darkness. But however, after that strictness was done, you see how really this darkness and the strictness was internally in its deepest sense for, and not just it's for good, but it itself was leading to good. It was coming from the strength of chesed, of benevolence, and a great light. In other words, how do you see it in the Geul of Yudbeis Tamos? On the one hand, the Rebbe went through all kinds of suffering. And he went through all kinds of uh, inuyim, all kinds of, of tortures, being in prison in the worst way. Till he even had a decree of opposite of life against him. <coughs> we know that there was a, the initial judgment against him was to end his life, God, God forbid. On the other hand, you saw that in the redemption of Yudbeis and Gimel Tamos, not just was the Rebbe freed, Not just how that was walked back, but you see how everything that was taking place throughout that imprisonment was really not in order to limit the Rebbe, in order to bring out a great, great chesed, in order to prepare, prepare the way to even broaden the work of spreading Teda, a totally higher and greater level, because then to, to, to reach the entire world. Think about it. Because of Yubeis Gimel Tamuz, Friedrich Rebbe left Russia, and then he started spreading terror forth in the entire world. You're sitting here and listening to this Hasidus is because, because of Yubeis Tamuz. And as here brought in square brackets, uh, Chazal, I say, just tell us what the Rebbe Rashab said <coughs> about the imprisonment of Alter Rebbe. Although he does say it's difficult, it's difficult to say this, but the truth is like this, that what? That just like a olive, in order to get out, when you squeeze it, the oil comes out. Similarly, the Al-Tarebbe being in prison led him to a much greater expanded revelation of Hasidus. There, that Rebbe Hashab speaks about the difference of the Hasidus of the Al-Tarebbe pre, before being in prison in St. Petersburg, in Petersburg, and after Petersburg. Similarly here, Yudbeis Tammuz brought a totally new dimension. And more than that, the Geul of Yudbeis Tammuz actually transformed some of the actual um, cap- days of captivity. What do we mean? Um, so it, not just that it showed that the days leading up to Yud Beis Tammuz were actually a preparation for a later redemption, but actually there's a day that actually got transformed in its essence. Which day? The third of Tammuz, Gimel Tammuz. What happened on Gimel Tammuz? The Rebbe was freed from actual imprisonment and he was sent to exile for three years so at that time when he was sent to exile it looked like he was being put into a very tenuous situation it looked like it was another stage of imprisonment being sent to Golis and in some ways being sent to exile is worse than death sorry is just as bad as death like the Chinuch is explains not just that. Nobody knew, was this really a tactic? Was this a ploy to get... There was a lot of pressure from the diplomacy of outside Russia. There was a lot of pressure to free the previous Rebbe. So there was those that said that you were able to think that this was just a ploy to get rid of the pressure. And then they'll, when, when the eyes of the world aren't upon them, when there's no more noise about them having imprisoned the Friedrich Rebbe, they would, God forbid, do what they had initially intended to do. <coughs> So the Geul of Yud Beis Tammuz revealed that no, once once Yud Beis Tammuz happened, we looked back and we saw that really Gimel Tammuz was not a ploy. It was not the beginning of something bad. It was actually a redemption. He was redeemed from prison on Gimel Tammuz. It became a day of salvation, which we only knew afterwards. It got transformed. Initially, Gimel Tammuz was a day of exile. And then that gets transformed to becoming the beginning of the redemption. And in a way, it's even greater Yud Beis Tammuz, because Yud Beis Tammuz was just being redeemed from exile, but Gimel Tammuz was being redeemed from incarceration, imprisonment, being in the hands of the enemy and facing, God forbid. But we didn't see that until after Yud Beis Tammuz. Then we understood that Gimel Tammuz was really a redemptive day. So 
First Gimel Damas was a, a day of further imprisonment, just in a different way, perhaps even a cunning, sly trick to get the eyes of the world off and then to, God forbid, Yud Beis Tamas, it turns out, no, Gimel Tamas was actually the redemption. So that day tr- is transformed. Just like when Mashiach comes, the days are going to be transformed. Vav, so from this we can all understand the two extremes in the day when we talk about the month of Tamas. In all the generations, when in the month of Tammuz, the only thing that was felt in the month of Tammuz was the way it is in its externality. The fast and the suffering of Tammuz. So was, that was the name of, of idolatry. It's a time of, in other words, what's idolatry? A time of concealment, ungodliness. So much so that it's the ultimate of concealment is when something is idolatrous, denying God. However, we got closer to the time of the redemption. So Pnimi Sater, the inner track of Teira, revealed that the inside track of everything is holy. So the inside aspect of Tamils is actually the heat of the strength of the sun, which represents Hashem. Yes, Tamils is darkness, <laughs> it's idolatry, but that internally and that deeper down there's the power to have a greater revelation of Hashem. And once that is revealed in Torah, when it comes down into the world, in other words, not just in Torah, that Tammuz now, instead of Tammuz being a, day, a name of idolatry, now we can look deeper into Tammuz and see as, as representing the strength of Hashem that denies idolatry. <coughs> then that Torah concept and, and concept, concept actually comes down to the world with a act happening in the world of redemption. And we were able to see with physical eyes the strength of the revelation of the sun, the way the sun represents Hashem, higher than nature, just like the sun represents higher than nature, which was able to shine through and break through the lowest levels of concealment and, and darkness. The worst opponents of Torah mitzvahs, idolatry, in this case, those that were fighting the Friedrich Kedeva, those who were fighting his efforts for Yiddishkeit, were vanquished. They had to, they had to let him free. And they knew that by freeing the, the, the Friedrich Kedeva, this would give strength and, 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 and encouragement to those who were doing the work of the Friedrich Kedeva. So they had no choice. They had to agree to let him free. They had to agree, not just let him free, but that that basically they agreed to allow for the work to grow even greater so what was a, a, a strong force against Kedusha now becomes something that actually helps Kedusha so one of the uh, Zion, one of the simple lessons from this is when you come close when we come close to the days of Bein HaMetzorim the days between the three weeks and a Jew starts to think how great and how awesome, how, like overwhelming is the darkness of the time of Golis in general especially the time of the hills of Mashiach so much darkness a a Jew, God forbid could fall into a situation of being feeling helpless, feeling like giving up he doesn't know how he's going to overcome all the difficulties so he knows Taka everyone knows that through struggling and suffering through the sufferings of the time of exile afterwards they'll come some advantage in the Geula the Geula as dark as it was that's how light it's going to be but now when he's in the time of concealment how does it, it's, it's dark it's bitter how do you how do you live through it that's where we have this teaching the Torah tells us that no in our generation this generation which is so dark which is so challenged a challenge generation of the heels of Mashiach before Mashiach comes here we have a great gift that we have even as it's so dark we have the revelation of the inner previous of the inner aspect of Torah which reveals and spreads the fact that the inner content of these days is the strength of love of Hashem to the Yid again as we said Hashem washing us around right and that's really what the day is about. And in order to let us get into the zone to understand that this is the inner content of the day, first we have these basic times, which shows us that even in the time of, of, of exile, when there were forces in the communist Russia that tried to squash 
Friedrich Rebbe, that actually turned into the work becoming greater. Because deep down, the greatest, um, the greatest um, barrier is actually a way to have a greater expression of the strength of Hashem. And that should give us encouragement, encouragement also now. These days where we're talking, remember, we're about to go into the three weeks, remember the destruction. Remember that the inner aspect and core of, this, of, 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 of exile is Kedusha, is good. It's, it's Hashem's love to us. We shouldn't um, get affected by the bitterness and by the dejectedness that we could fall into because of the time of Golis, because of the situation of being in exile. Now, here, of course, as the Rebbe in square brackets, of course, we have to do all the halachas of mourning, just like Shulchan Aruch tells us, with all its details. However, I'll be tell you, if you understand that the context is that this is actually Hashem's love to us, and we're, as we come closer to Mashiach, we're able to tap into that. So now we find, can find ways that, according to the Torah, halachatic ways, we're able to make it a little happier, a little more joyous. For example, you can finish a Masech, as the Rebbe wanted us always to finish. On all the nine days of Masechta. And then it becomes a Yom Tov. You're allowed to have a feast, you're allowed to have a meal. Until the halacha is, we don't actually practice this uh, necessarily. You're allowed to have even a, a, a meat meal when you make a Siyam Masechta in the nine days. So, in other words, that's a way I'll peak there, according to the way you can inject joy into the days that the Shukhanar tells you have to be with less joy. However, or you can in general learn more Torah about Torah. It says it gladdens the heart. That's a permissible way to gladden your heart. Especially by learning what the Rebbe told us to learn in the three weeks, the laws of the Beis HaMikdash. But through learning Torah, and through learning the, the, the way, the design of the Beis HaMikdash, so it says, Hashem says, it's if you built the Beis HaMikdash. If, by acting in this way, by treating the, the three weeks as days that have a very strong um, um, redemptive aspect to them coming from Hashem's love so then that anhoga, this kind of behavior brings out in a revealed way the panemius, the inner aspect of the Ben how they will be in the time to come when Shia comes, what's going to be in the time to come all will feel this love of Hashem and that's why these days will be transformed to joy and jubilance and good festivals uh, says the Rebbe here that when we work this way, when we try and reframe these days and see them from the inside aspect, again, halachically we mourn, but seeing them from their internal concept of being days where we um, where we where we feel the love of Hashem. So it says the Rebbe in R63, Yeshle, we could say that through this we can reveal the fact that He's able to do this without making us suffer also usually no pain, no gain, so to speak, right? But Hashem is able to do everything. He can make us have gain with no pain also. So by revealing the love of Hashem, we can actually access a place where we can take away the suffering because Hashem can bring us to that same great advantage also without you sooner than you suffer. May that be the case. I told you I'm going to, just briefly, I'm going to go back here. Out of 48, the Rebbe says that um, in the Kutas Sichas, Chedek Aleph, the Rebbe speaks about three aspects of suffering. It says, first of all, about suffering, it says that those that understand the suffering um, come from a deeper place in Hashem, so they will benefit the deeper revelation of Hashem by understanding to be joyous even while they're suffering, because understanding it comes from a place in Hashem which can come out into a revealed good. And then there's the aspect of... Um, but there's the aspect of hang on one second Just hang on one second <laughs> Then there's another aspect. Um, 
so okay, three aspects he brought in Tanya. First is in the first book of Tanya, Perik Chavav, that the uh, way for Yisurim, if somebody, God forbid, is suffering, is to receive them with joy, because then he's going to cause that when Mashiach comes and things are going to be revealed, it's going to come down in a, in, a, in a good way, in a revealed way. But you've got to wait for Mashiach to come for that. Then there's another, in the Gersa Kedish, the Alter Rebbe says, that a person should um, understand that this is Hashem cleansing him. Right? And that comes because of Hashem's great love. So if a person feels that and thinks about it, reframes it that way, then Hashem's great love will shine to him, and then it will be an open love and he won't have to have any suffering. So the thing is, you don't have to wait for Mashiach to come for that, but you need to reframe things. You need to have a meditation, reframe things. Then there's another place in the Geras HaKedish where the al Tarebbe says the eights, uh, that the person should see difficulties as being a test. The moment he knows the test, is, okay, then the test doesn't have to continue. You stand up to the test, it started and you didn't, something bad happened, you didn't lose your fluster, you kept on, uh, you kept on cleaving to Hashem, then okay, no need to have any more suffering, you prove the point. However, there's still suffering and then only then you cancel it out. Rabbi Shimon and Yechai, Pnimi Satayra, what, what the Rabbi here is talking about is Rabbi Shimon and Yechai, um, was able to find within the negativity, it shouldn't be negativity at all. Um, and the Rebbe says here, that through Pnimi Satera, what the Rebbe is trying to achieve through this reframing is not that I have to, we have to wait, like the three levels here we just, just discussed, but that the inside track of what's happening right now, the suffering of Golis, is actually Hashem's love to us. If you can see the Pnimius right now, then as we said at the end of the Sikha, then the love of Hashem can be revealed, and He can do the same result without, without having us suffer. May that be the will of Hashem. Amen.